when we when I first started working there, May of 2015, the primaries had already started. Um, and some people were reluctant to use Snapchat uh, from an advertising perspective and from a content perspective. They just didn't get it. And the first two people to adopt it were Scott Walker and John Kasich because they had children who were in college and high school that said, Dad, this is the only thing that me and my friends do. Um, but eventually it became very easy to book guests because, and not under any conditions, but because this is an audience that is very hard to reach in today's media environment. Right, you can't just go on cable news and expect to talk to 18 to 34 year olds. Like, they're not there. They're not watching cable news. They're not watching the Sunday shows. So Snapchat became a great vehicle for that. So what adjustment was this for you? So you're coming from CNN, right? So you're coming from the vocabulary and vernacular of you know Wolf Blitzer and yeah. you know CNN, and now you're going into a place where you're trying to create a different channel of communication around the same types of issues. So. How did you sort of adjust, or did you adjust the way you report, the way you conceive issues? The biggest personal challenge was just going from uh, a world where, um, you know, CNN is a, is a huge company with like systems and a way of doing things and a culture of journalism to um, a company where, you know, me and my team were tasked with building an editorial team and a news team. So that was a, a challenge in a good way. Um, but in terms of sensibility and point of view, at CNN, and I started there in 2005, even back then I would have conversations with friends of mine at the time when I was in my 20s who just weren't watching television and sort of looked at the kind of trope of the TV anchorman and the TV reporter and, and felt it was kind of inauthentic and not necessarily the most trustworthy thing and they were spending most of their time online anyway before mobile. And so at CNN, my whole career was more oriented toward digital. I would always push back on the idea of, you know, putting on a tie and going on TV. And I really, really, really cared about going on the road and writing stories and then feeding new platforms and experimenting with video. So being able, Snapchat allowed me to sort of run wild with that when I came over. So it wasn't a huge cultural adjustment. Um, and, you know, there were people that worked in political campaigns and a lot of the decision makers in political campaigns are so accustomed to television and so accustomed to print and, and uh, but a lot of the younger, more digitally fluent staffers and operatives I knew were like, this is so smart because this is where the audience is moving. So it wasn't that much of an adjustment from an editorial perspective. Mm. Did you feel that because you were, you were doing this with Snapchat and you were thinking about your audience that you were seeing things about the country or about the electorate that other parts of the media were yes. perceiving? Yes, yes. And I can't wait to talk about this later. But um, the it, would be, it, it was remarkable. One, one, working at Snapchat, we have, you know, our audience at our fingertips. We, we, we know and can learn from what they want and what their tastes are and how they're consuming information all of that. Um, going to political events, I would walk around these events and people would come up to me having recognized me from Snapchat and being and loving Snapchat and spending all of their time on Snapchat. And in the most earnest way, say thank you for, you know, explaining this election. Thank you for, for cutting through the clutter for people my age. It's really helpful. Um, and I didn't see them doing the same thing for sort of hallowed TV anchors that we're all used to seeing on TV. Um, there is a huge, 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 huge part of this country that isn't even participating in the sort of received wisdom of Washington and in the, in the consensus dialogue of traditional media. They're not reading the Washington Post, they're not reading the New York Times, they're not watching CNN, they're not reading NBC, all great places. But I don't think we can even begin to fathom the boundaries of the political conversation that's happening right now. People are talking about politics in subreddits and in group me chats and on Facebook and they're, and on Snapchat and they're consuming all kinds of different information and they view the traditional media with a ton of skepticism, some of it deserved and some not. Um, but it was really interesting being on the frontiers and outside of that bubble and then peering back in and watching my former colleagues and my friends have a discussion that I actually didn't hear. Um, a corollary to that is, is frankly just getting away from the kind of Twitter funnel 
is will always be valuable. I mean, I just spent a lot of time traveling this election as I always have, and there's just a different conversation that happens outside of Twitter, outside of Washington, outside of New York. So you um, feel like tw the Twitter funnel is really part is really embedded in the mainstream. I mean, mo more than embedded. It's the first and and after the 2012 campaign, I I wrote a thesis on this at Harvard sure. about how Twitter really narrowed the discussion. Um, in a lot of ways, it's great because it brings to the fore so much information. If you're a political junkie, you can get the latest polls, you can engage in debate. It's, it, it is the news feed for a lot of political journalists and political operatives, most of them, in fact. Um, but it becomes so focused on process, it becomes so focused on argument and who's smarter than who that people lose sight of what voters, I think, are actually talking about and thinking about. Um, it's a chicken and egg thing. I mean, voters talk about what they see on television and what they read online, um, but they also care about things that aren't being covered in the media. Um, I spent a lot of time in Ohio um, between the convention and election day, in part because my girlfriend was a journalist there and I was visit, visit her. Every single day in Ohio, the front page of the Columbus Dispatch, Cincinnati Enquirer, Youngstown Vindicator, local news, it was on billboards, was the opioid epidemic. Um, people were talking about drug abuse, people whispered about it. It was the number one issue that people cared about. I remember being at Obama's final rally in Cleveland and there was a woman on the front row clutching a picture of her deceased husband and kept yelling at Obama from a distance of 10 feet, what about heroin, what about heroin? And he, you know, as the practice politician was ignoring her and just sort of focusing on the message. That issue was completely undiscussed in the national media. Um, and many others were as well. So I, I do think Twitter, Twitter has an effect of really narrowing the conversation uh, in a way that creates its own echo chamber for members of the media establishment. In the, in the news environment where your audience is living, how do you fit into that? Is, is that a sort of ecosystem you can perceive and how do you fit into it? So there's 150 over 150 million daily users on Snapchat. So it's hard to call it an ecosystem when it's that big. Um, but I think to the question you're asking, we have thought deeply about um, delivering authoritative, incredible news and information on our platform, which means in my case, like we've hired journalists and whether it's sports or music or entertainment or whatever, Snapchat has made an effort to hire experts, journalists, editors, um, curators who uh, have the experience to um, produce and deliver content that is authoritative and credible. And we also have publishers like CNN and BuzzFeed and New York Times and The Economist who are on the platform and they own the content. But it's, uh, it, those are our exclusive partners. So. Um, in terms of the fake news debate, there's not really a way for public-facing uh, fake news to go viral on Snapchat. It's just it's it's actually impossible on the platform. Um, but I do think that part of that is that we have a belief that editors matter, that curation matters, that expertise matters. Um, we take our reach and our audience seriously, um, and I'm you know proud that we have made that commitment. What do you, how, how's covering a Trump uh, administration look to you? <sighs> from Snapchat or for? Yeah, Snapchat. Um, I think we, like many people, <laughs> like most people in the media, um, I think myself and others assumed Hillary was going to win. Um, I think Trump's victory was a wake-up call about not just our traditional media's eroding place in the new, in the sort of information ecosystem, but also that um, never to take anything for granted. And I think we're going to cover the Trump administration, not just from Washington and not just in a um, by the lens of process and who is he appointed and who's up and who's down. Um, I think we really want to both cover it from the perspective of the people who voted for Trump and want to make sure that he carries through on his promises, um, the people who are protesting in the streets, particularly young people, um, 
you know, most of our audience is between the age of 13 and 34. So we're keenly attuned to what they are interested in. And most of those people voted for Hillary Clinton and not Donald Trump. That doesn't mean we're going to be anti-Trump, um, but it does mean that we have to sort of keep a very critical lens on the administration. Um, you know, we'll see how he treats the media as well. I mean, Trump is uh, gets a lot of credit for using Twitter to impact the conversation. But a friend of mine who works at the New York Times also calls him unfrozen media caveman. Like, he really, he watches the cable shows, the Sunday shows, and reads the front pages of newspapers. Like, he's very old school in his media diet, in other words. So does he have interest in engaging with uh, the explosion of digital outlets out there? Um, We'll see, but I do think we have a duty not just to cover the Trump administration from Washington, but from around this, this country and around the world, and also to really just get outside of the the process that we in political journalism have, you know, agreed is the way things work. I mean, I think we have always viewed we viewed Trump and his supporters for a long time as a fringe part of the discussion, and I don't think Bernie Sanders was taken very seriously because he was viewed as a fringy candidate as well. Um, I think we have a duty to embed ourselves with the people who are in the streets protesting Donald Trump and a duty to embed ourselves with um, you know, people on the right as well who support Donald Trump to really understand what is motivating them and also how they're processing information. Mm. Like I really wish in the exit polls there was a question that was like, how did you get your information this cycle? Um, that wasn't in there because the exit polls are run by the five TV networks and the AP and they don't really mm. seem to have much interest in that. But again, back to the point of like where the boundaries of our conversation are, I would, I just really, really, really want to figure out how people are viewing this campaign because whereas we are all watching CNN and reading the same newspapers, most people are not. And uh, that is a problem and a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us to rethink how we tell stories and how we reach audiences.